whether they're in the office or at home, I was going to say shouldn't differ, but really it should actually, they should be more productive at home. I mean, I, I know during lockdown, I was, a lot, I was a lot more productive. Hey guys, it's Matt Haycox here, and we are filming from Ibiza on day one of our Mastermind Summer Retreat. So today I'm at the table with Chris Taylor and Jamie York, our resident Instagram maestro and property expert, Jamie. And uh, we're, we're gonna be having our first mastermind. We're gonna be chatting about the economy, uh, opportunities that are gonna present themselves to us at the moment. We're gonna talk about marketing. Undoubtedly, we're gonna talk about property. And we're just gonna see how the conversation flows and pick each other's brains. So I hope you enjoy the conversation and there's gonna be plenty more like this coming for you over the next few days. Well, I'm gonna kick this off. Uh, and I'm gonna throw it over to you as a property question, really. Uh, and I wanna know what, what kind of, sentiment changes you've seen over over the last few months as lockdowns happened and then as we've started to come out of it i mean as you know i mean i've got exposure to the to the property space both as a trader and an investor uh, but i guess you've probably got your finger a little bit closer to the pulse than, than most of us uh, what, what what have you seen going on and, and where do you think the next six to 12 months are going to take us yeah so that's a really great question i think a lot of people are sort of throwing themselves at it right now um, in the property world, but it's it's moved so much in the last six months, more than I've seen in the last six years, to be honest. And um, I think people, well, obviously some were prepared for a black swan event, you know, that we get every five to 10 years, but nobody could have predicted this. Nobody would have thought this would happen. And I think because of that, nobody had anything in place to sort of cope with it. So I saw some of the really big companies cutting way back on their marketing, um, a load of big property investors that I know were just like, look, there's no point we're shutting down shop for a few months or that they might as well have anyway. More importantly, obviously, pretty much, well, it's about 60% of the market is first time buyer mortgage buyers. And so most people that are buying a property to live in themselves are not going to buy a property without doing a full viewing, seeing everything, which is really difficult because obviously you can't do it during or you couldn't do it during lockdown. So we we actually saw a massive increase in purchases going on for, from an investment point of view, um, but the rest of the market kind of shut down. So did the market shift in terms of market values? No. Um, I don't think so, but you know, how can you tell in such a short period of time? But obviously the volume of deals going through um, completely stopped or halted, if you like. But then as soon as we saw the mo uh, market reopen, it was kind of like a Nike tick, like it went down slightly and then boom, right up. So um, what is it? We had 1.5% um, growth on last year um, during a line, um, last year in July. So suddenly on property prices, that is in one month is bloody incredible. So, and a big part of that is it's almost like if you can imagine lining people up and you're getting ready for a race and you're sort of burning them from the back, getting them excited, right? You're ready, you're ready, don't go yet, don't go yet, don't go yet. And then opening the floodgates and going, right, you all need to go. But there's only a certain amount of stock but there's a lot more people suddenly want to move, suddenly want to invest, suddenly want to buy their property and go, go, go. So actually you saw a real strong rise in the market and that there's a lot of confusion right now because there's the movement, which is pushing things up. There's the uncertainty that's pushing things down. There's people wanting to move quickly because they don't know what's going to happen and people that want to slow it down because they don't know what's going to happen. So right now I'm quite excited. We've, we've got a number of purchases going through. We trade quite a lot as well. Got a lot of investor deals going through. I think we've got between 45 and 50 going through legals right now. And, um, and yeah, it's just a really exciting time. The next six months, what do I think is going to happen? I actually think it's the next 18 months that we need to look at. You know, in the UK, we're so fortunate in, I think, how well the government has responded. You know, C bills, B bills, furlough schemes. And yeah, sure, there were people that fell through the net. I get that. You know, you're never going to encompass everyone. But the downside of that much money coming in is you need to think like people are going the government wow they've paid for this well no it's the taxpayers like we are the government we pay for all of that so i think we're going to be hit um with some complex taxes and i think tax strategies are definitely going to be a thing of to be looked into so hiring good accountants is going to be important over the next couple of years but i do wonder what happens when b bills needs to start getting paid back 
What happens when sea bills needs to be paid back? What happens when people start investigating furlough and all of these things that every, everyone suddenly turned over 200,000 overnight, right? So they could get the 50K. And the thing is, even though the interest rate is, you know, zero point fuck all basically, but when it comes back to that repayment in 12 months time and it's 800 pound a month, how many small businesses do you know that can suddenly take on 800 pound a month on top of what they've got going already? Not many. So, you know, that's that's going to be interesting. I think a lot of people are going to get fired in October um, because that's the first wave of the furlough. I think a lot more are going to get fired in January and February um, because the the grants stop, the, any help stops. You get your, what is it, £1,000 for keeping somebody on. Yeah, and I think we're going to see some of the highest unemployment that we've seen in history. And I think that's when the money's going to start running dry and that. That's when there's going to be a dip but also massive It's interesting what you say when you talk about the fact that, uh, you know, what a business is going to do when they've got to pay the 800 quid a month or or whatever the figure is going to be in 12 months' time when they do have to start making the payments on the bounce back loans. Because one of the things I was talking about very heavily at the beginning of uh, of lockdown was that this was really the event that kind of needed to happen for uh, for the cleansing of shit businesses, really, (laughs) in in that, you know, I was was talking very much about the fact that uh, UK SME has been bankrupt uh, for a very long time, you know, 6, 12, 18, 36, 48 months even. And, uh, you know, I can, I can tell you firsthand from the, you know, from the countless loan applications that we look at, you know, week in, week out, that a vast, vast proportion of UK SMEs have either been treading water or losing money for months, if not years. Um, and at the beginning of you know at the beginning of lockdown, you know, when when the corona problems were starting, uh, you know th- these businesses were complaining that um, they were facing they were facing bankruptcy or they were under severe pressure because um, because of lockdown uh, and, and, and because of corona. And what I talked about very much was the fact that these businesses have. I've been waiting for an event, you know, to, to effectively push them over the edge. You know, they, they they talk about the fact that you know Corona was a killer for them, but these businesses were inequipped to be able to cover, so to be able to um, suffer a week of no cash flow, a couple of weeks of no cash flow. So, so at the beginning of lockdown, I was very much talking about the fact that, you know, this is the event we needed to kind of push these crap businesses over the edge, to give people a reality check, uh, you know, f- for, them, for them to realize that that business wasn't viable. Maybe they aren't business people, maybe they aren't entrepreneurs, and as hard as it may be for them to accept, you know, m- m- you know maybe that was the time, you know, for, for, the, for the reset, for the business, for the economy, and, and for the individual. But now, you know, coming out of this 12 12, 14 weeks after uh, having uh, you know ha- having made those uh, statements <laughs> the, the, they were actually probably um, worse off than we were when we started uh, by worse off I, I mean you know, these businesses have been given even more support to keep prolonging the agony and uh, you know and what I thought would have been uh, you know almost like a, a worthwhile and important event to you know to, to push these businesses over the edge to you know to, to, to have that reset we're now looking at the fact that with 10 grand 15 20 grand worth of grants with 20 30 40 50 grand worth of bounce back loans uh, and, and potentially some furlough money and and, and potentially other bits of support, these businesses have actually probably never looked at so much cash. Um, and, you know, it's given them another 6, 12, 18, 24 months to survive. I mean, so, you know, some of these UK businesses have actually probably never had it so good. When I say never had it so good, I don't mean in terms of trade, but let's say in, in terms of the cash, you know, cash that they've got, you know, cash in bank, um, you know, if, I mean, how many small businesses out there do you know that bust their ass week in, week out, working 40, 50, 60, 70 hours to just about scrape the payroll together at the end of the month to maybe make themselves a grand, 1,500 quid, a couple of grand? And, you know, something I've always you know, talked very strongly about is the fact that, you know, you really need to ask yourself why you're doing it at that point. You know, uh, it, I mean, if you're going to, if you love what you do and you and, and it's almost a, you know, a passion project, let's say, then fine, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not... Uh, uh, I'm not trying to you know, belittle anyone's uh, anyone's wishes or dreams, you know, but 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 if you're setting out there to make a profitable business and working, you know, 50, 60, 70 hours a week and taking all the risk and all the stress that comes with it to make a grand 1500 quid at the end of the month, you know, what I mean, what the fuck are you doing it for? You know, you you you'd be, you'd be better off you know, work, working in a bar or you know work, work, working at the at the checkout in Tesco's. 
And for these businesses, you know, who've been who've been used to having zero cash in bank at the end of the month, they're now actually looking at 50, 60, 70, 80 grand worth of cash. Um, and it's and for some of them, it's given them the it's given them the uh, support mechanism to carry on being a zombie for the next two or three or four years. Um, so I think it, it, you know it's going to be an interesting time. I mean, you know, I, I'm quite heavily involved in in the insolvency world in terms in terms of uh, acquiring assets from insolvency and and. and and funding borrowers who are either going into or, or coming out of some kind of process. And all my all my conversations with insolvency practitioners at the beginning of uh, lockdown were around the fact that look, you know, nothing's going to happen for two or three months now. But you know, when we start to come out of this in you know August, September, October, you know, they think they're going to be busy again. And look, we're starting to see that in some of the, in some of the bigger businesses. I mean, particularly leisure, because I guess that's you know that's been the business that's been hardest hit. You know, the, your, your biggest expenses are staff and, and staff and uh, rent. And okay, whilst furlough's been of assistance up to now. It's it's going to be of less assistance going forward, and there's and there's certainly been no assistance uh, as far as support for rent has been, unless landlords have chosen chosen to give it for you. So I guess these are the bigger businesses that have been the, the hardest hit, uh, and and they they've been the ones that are now starting you know starting to file for administration, starting to go into CVAs and and, and go through some kind of process. But you know, but the the, the man on the man on the street business, you know, the the, the one man band entrepreneur, the, 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 the you know the two or three person SME. I think these guys have got, you know, year, years of life put back into them. I say years of life, you know, y y years of tread treading water um, to, you know, to, I guess, continue to waste their time. And, 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 and if anything, you know, these people really just need to be thinking, uh, you know, how, you know, do I do I have a viable business? You know, look, it was put it, but the problem is it was hard enough for them. To, to make this decision six months ago. How the fuck are they going to make it now with, you know, 50 grand in the bank? I oh, know, totally. I think it's quite a, a fascinating subject. And I can only talk about it from experience, not really in the, the property sector, but just in general business, like that I've been running for the last six months. I think the last three months of 2019, I think I was like, classified as a very, very lazy business person, kind of got very comfortable in terms of like the way that the business was operating. And I think what COVID's kind of pushed us into is, kind of like you either innovate or you kind of die right now in the way that the kind of businesses are operating. And the biggest success stories that have come from COVID are the ones that are willing to switch it up, be a bit more dynamic, be a bit more proactive rather than being reactive. We hear it all the time. And it's been the thing that's made the biggest difference to us is that we're no longer just thinking about and reacting to day by day stuff that's going on. We're really trying to think about in six, 12, 18 months time, What's it kind of going to look like so we can prepare? And that is both from kind of a lead generation sales perspective, but also cash flow. I think cash flow is neglected and not spoken about enough. And I think the biggest success stories that are coming out of this are the ones that maintain cash flow. It's the thing that I don't think a lot of people speak about. And I know you two are very, very big advocates of, of cash flow. It's what I've learned from both of you from working with you only the last few months or so. But what are your thoughts on, on kind of that concept with? with cash flow and the way that business have been. Do you mean buffer systems and stuff? Well, buffers, yeah, I think buffer systems, but also having like a real idea of what's coming in and what's going out. Like, I think people lose sight of it. It's, it's basic business acumen, isn't it? Like, like it, it's, um, I think business has always been the fast and the dead. It's just expedited that process where now you need to get on it. It's thrive or die. You know, the, the, it's just you, you, you're probably right, Matt, in that it's delaying the inevitable for six to 12 months or a couple of years. But it could also be for a small percentage, the oxygen that they've been waiting for. Um, that 50 grand could change the rest of their lives for, for the positive. So I think it's really hard where, you know, can you go? Are the government, is anyone in the government well placed to assess a business and go, that one will probably be successful, that one probably won't? Almost definitely not. But, you know, what, what's it going to do? And it, it's just speeding that process up. Like you said, if they were struggling before and they were scraping a grand, two grand at the end of the month, then in a year's time, they're going to have another £800 a month sort of cost and they're 50 grand in debt and they're looking at the books. So sometimes, it, did you, you know, to, you have to be a nuts to be an entrepreneur. Like borderline psychotic is fucking hard. Like why? Like you, if you look at your salary that you're going to be earning starting out, it's going to be, it's got to be below minimum wage for most people. You know, you work. It's the only only time that you'll work five till nine instead of nine to five. Get paid fuck all for it. Look shit for it. People seem to have a go at you. You seem to be missed out. 
And so, you know, in the first place, you need a certain mentality because it's scary. Um, not only having to, you know, feed yourself, but feed your staff, pay for mortgages, pay for their mortgages, pay for the rent, things like that. So it really is that time where people are getting a, a good understanding of if they really are an entrepreneur or not. And I think, first of all, just self-awareness is key in this to go, actually, it's OK. I'm not a number one. Doesn't mean you can't be a business owner, but you might be a number two. You might you might be a solopreneur. You might be an entrepreneur in somebody else's business, and that's great. And you're supported and nurtured through that. But I think self awareness is so key in in any space of business. But certainly now with all the shit that's going on, in terms of the cash flow situation, you're saying the the SME space. What, what about these big boys? Like it's it's terrifying. I think some of these massive companies that they suffer three four weeks of no money coming in, cash flow situation. And they're like, I think we're gonna have to fire. It's like, are you kidding me? Your business wasn't prepared to make no money for a couple of weeks. But actually, if you look at the FTSE 100 and the FTSE 250, there's a lot of those businesses that actually, if they stopped making money for, well, look at look at all the airlines. You know, even Richard Branson, who is possibly one of the pioneers of entrepreneurship in not only England, but the world. He's sort of talking about shutting uh, things down, going to his staff saying, look, I'm gonna have to not pay you or cut your pay or do this and do that. Um, and it does just come back to those bread and butter basics is looking at the numbers. Because you're right, most people don't. It's just activity. Just keep busy. But but as well, I mean, when we said you know, looking at the numbers, you know, so many business owners have absolutely zero understanding of of the finances in their business. Uh, you know, I mean, I can tell you this from from countless conversations with, with entrepreneurs, and also you know, even more worryingly, or let's say almost as worryingly, when I deal with bigger businesses, uh, where, for example, a, a, an owner, uh, a managing director, is is conversing with his overall loan application uh, and, and we'll ask some questions about the numbers you know uh, problems or, or holes that we've seen in their financials and the, re the response invariably is I can't answer that I've got an accountant who who, um, who deals with my numbers or you know I'm going to need to I'm going to need to pa pass you over to my FD now I'm certainly not advocating for the fact that you know you, you need to be all things to all people because you know, obviously you know, every everyone has the areas that they, that they excel in um, but I think it's, it's key as a business owner uh, to have, you know, at least a let's say, a moderate, moderate understanding of absolutely every area of your business, but none more importantly than you know than finances. I mean, you know, the the number of business owners, you know, the number of entrepreneurs who don't understand the difference between a PL and a balance sheet, you know, who who don't, who don't understand the difference between profit and cash, uh, is is absolutely frightening. Um, and you know, and I guess this all, this always comes down to the um, yeah you know, this always comes down to the fact that as well you know, for me people sh think they have no need or, uh, or or certainly have no desire to continue learning you know past 16 or past 18 or or, 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 or past 21 um, you know, and maybe it's the you know, like I say the, the the British proudness or or, or, or failure to want to you know to, to accept accept our shortcomings and, and, and our misgivings um, but you know <laughs> If I mean, for, I mean, for me, basic accountancy. You know, let's say the, the the kind of accountancy that could be taught in a day should be absolutely, uh, you know, compulsory for, you know, for for anyone before they become a business owner. I mean, I think I think if I was a business bank, uh, I sh I'd, I'd make it compulsory. You know, before you were allowed to open an account with me to um you know, to, to 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 use to bank your business, I would insist that that, that you went that you went on a one day basic accounting course because yeah like. The the level of elementary mistakes that are made by business owners that have absolutely catastrophic, uh, you know, um, almost like domino domino effects is just is just frightening. I think you know, most of the things we'll talk about, you know, whether it's property or finance or or or, or, or marketing. You know, it, at a basic level, none of what any of us do is rocket science, uh, and 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 it, you know, and it can be learned by anyone. It, you know, it can it can be taught by many. Um, but you know, but, but but business business owners just don't seem to have a desire to you know to to want to learn these uh, these theories, you know, to want to learn this information. And I think as well, 
you know, one of the things I, I talk a lot about is the fact that you know when someone becomes you know when you become a sports person uh, or you know, if you're a professional sports person you'll all you know you'll always be training you'll you'll, you'll always have your team around you because you know, because you know that there's always you know that, that millimeter of improvement that you can have or, or, the, or the, you know the fact that there's always somebody you know younger and faster and hungrier who, who who's who's up and coming and you know you've got to keep training you've got to keep trying uh, trying new techniques you know le- le- learning new methods you know I mean I guess. Uh, almost like a, you know, the, the, you know, the film analogy would be uh, you know, Rocky IV. You know, when, 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 you, when you're looking at Rocky and, 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 you, and you're looking at Ivan, Ivan Drago, okay, it, it may be a, a bad example to a degree that in the, in, in the end, you know, R- R- Rocky's sheer will and determination, you know, m- makes him win. But you know, if, if we, if we, t- we take the end of the film out, you know, the, the fact is, you know, when, when you look at his training compared to Ivan Drago's, it, it's, it's absolutely it's absolutely prehistoric. And if it wasn't the fact that it was a Hollywood movie. Uh, and, and 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 that we you know we need to believe in Rocky and we and we need to will him to win. You know, there's, there's no way that someone like him could con- could consistently better someone like Drago, who is who is constantly being tested and tweaked and improved and and improved and bettered. Um, and uh, and yeah, it's, I was just trying to think of the word. I was why is that? Why does it keep coming up? Why do these problems? And it's just ego. Um, if you could take ego out of people, the problem is if you take too much ego out, then the drive can go because actually the ego is what fuels the the rewarding instinct that you have. But also we have this weird sycophantic view on everything like, oh, you know what? I work all these hours and I I, I don't even pay myself from the business. It's just like, you're a fucking idiot then. Yeah. It's just like, why are you, why is that, why is that a badge of honor? All the time, I work myself to the bone. Why? Why is that? That's cool, and I graft. But it's like, why is that a badge of honor? Um, and it's it's also around self education. You know, honestly, we can learn a lot from um, the Americans on this. That self education is just where it starts for them. Um, you know, it's constant reinvestment. And if you look at all of the um, professional, you have CPD, right? Continuous professional development. As a matter of course, you have to do it on a yearly basis if you are a uh, a lawyer, for example, constantly reinvesting in your education. And I'm, I'm big on education. I've invested a lot of money in my education. Um, I've got it as part of staff contracts. If they want to go on training courses of some kind, I'll pay for them um, and stuff like that because it's so important um, to push. And having that, again, we talk, spoke about self-awareness earlier, the self-awareness to go, I don't understand this. Um, I, I think to a level, you need to have at least the core principles, the one day course. Are you going to be a tax specialist? No, you can hire people. Um, it's, it's like the whole um, Elon Musk thing. I, was like, I didn't go to Harvard, um, but I hire people that did. You know, you're, you're always hiring people smarter than you in their niche. But I still want to know the generic ways that pe- that things are working and it's it's the same with getting help in all areas is that we seem to want to learn from doing that the school of hard knocks i love it when i see it on somebody's facebook and i'm just like you're going to struggle forever and it's just like why would i want to learn from my you know learn from your mistakes fuck that i'd, r- I'd rather learn from yours i want to find out what problems you come up against in, in business because i don't want to repeat them and you know you go to anyone in bankruptcy that's been through bankruptcy are you happy you learned from that mistake or would you have preferred to learn that from somebody else you know it's 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 this weird thing that we have to go through something ourselves but actually if you educate yourself from the beginning the areas that you lack and and even from a um, you know i know this isn't about mental health but mental health perspective if you go to america pretty much every white collar will have a psychiatrist um, is that the right word? Psych- yeah, a, a psychiatrist that they'll see on a monthly basis. Go on, therapy. Therapists. How come my therapist? My therapist. Is, is that how they sound? How come <laughs> my therapist? But over here, it's almost like a, if you've got a therapist, you're weak. Yeah. And it's just like, again, that's ego. But if you take that out and get the support, get the education and push yourself forward, like, you know, let's link back to what we were actually talking about. But I think this is huge, the opportunity, huge opportunity for the right person. I think it's just a bit of a, I always look at this self-education thing, especially as like a business owner. And I think the one thing that it's not just I've struggled with it, people that I've, 
I've worked with, consulted for, struggle with it as well. It's like, what do you actually look to learn? Like a footballer, for instance, knows what he's got to train. Like every single aspect, like fitness, stamina, weight training, nutrition's got to be on point, um, flipping, shooting, penalties, free kicks, whatever it is that you're looking to do. They've got set flipping training plans to do. And I think as entrepreneurs, if you, if you can lay out what that training plan is and start off with the core foundations, but I don't think there's many many courses or educational systems out there that really teach that in terms of like the the fundamental breakdowns of what an entrepreneur really needs because again like i think there's so many different and every, I think the biggest thing is obviously everyone's unique and specializes in different things like i spent probably 90 percent of my time in my education with the marketing business just learning about how the social media platforms worked however as a business owner within six months suddenly those skills i'm not actually doing that day to day anymore because we now got a team in place that's doing it. And you go from being an operator, and I'm at a completely different level to you guys in terms of where you are in your businesses, but I'm now moving into that managerial type role, into that director type role, which I've not really done particularly brilliantly before. I've always been, you know what, um, I could do it better myself, so I'm just going to keep control of it. I've always been that perfectionist trying to do it. I think that's been the biggest thing that I've had to educate myself on. I think that's the thing that a lot of we call them SMEs, but they're not really like startup businesses where they get trapped because they're not willing and don't know how because it's quite difficult to to learn and well, find. Well, I, th- I think we have these same problems, you know, whether it's us, us as business owners or whether it's, you know, whether it's members of our team that, you know, ultimately you know, every time the business gets bigger or every time, you know, a, a member of staff does a bit better, you know, they, they get promoted. But, you know, they're never normally, uh, let's say, you know, qualified for that promotion. Other, other, you know, they, they, they need some some method of uh, of let's say thanks being you know thanks being told to them you know they, you know, they, they need that pay rise you know they, they need that new title but you know but but for example you know it, you may be the best salesperson in the world hammering the telephone building the pipeline closing the deals and making money you know that i guess that perceived next level of promotion is to make you to make you the sales manager but you know, they are two completely different roles, and and you go home on a Friday night, having been a great salesman, you know, with years of experience behind you, and you come to work on Monday morning, being you know a complete virgin manager, you know, with no with no management skills, you know, with with no no qualifications, you know, to to actually actually let you do that role, um, uh, and yet people have the arrogance to think that um, well, I guess the the members of staff have the arrogance to think that they don't need to be trained, and the business owners have the Stupidity to have to have not not trained them prior prior to the job. And I mean, listen, I, you know, I, I talk I talk about this uh, not uh, you know not as someone who's 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 necessarily done it perfect or even done it right, uh, but you know by any stretch. And I, I guess you know, I, you know we talk about um, you know l- learn, learning from our mistakes or, or or learning from others. And you know I guess unfortunately I probably spent the first fifteen years of my business you know <laughs> learning from my own mistakes before I I fully understood and embraced the concept you know the concepts of, of mentorship and you know standing standing on the shoulders of of, of, of giants, um, but. Um, but, but you know you, you see it day in day out. I think you know one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give to you know to, to any uh, any business owner, any any you know managing director, you know tr- trying to I guess plan for the future and, and grow grow their teams is is to really think you know six, twelve, eighteen, twenty four months down the line, you know with each of those members of staff of of where do you want them to be, where do they want themselves to be, and what tools and training can we give them prior to putting them there you know so, so if if steve is is you know is uh, kind of destined to be the sales manager in 12 18 months time then whilst he's doing his selling you know start getting him on the manage on, on the on the management courses start getting him you know shad- shadowing someone you know, being mentored by someone so that when he does ultimately end up becoming that manager in 12 or 18 months time you know he's okay it might be his first day on the job but yeah you know, but 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 he's he's come you know he's come with 12 18 months of training and he, and he and he's ready to kind of pick up the baton and, and carry it on rather than pick up the baton and wonder what the fuck it actually is yeah it's it's interesting i'm probably about three four weeks ago it's one of my mentees actually and uh they're going through the property space starting to hire a couple of people and uh he said one big worry i've got is what if i pay for training and then they leave i was just like what and it, and it was a genuine fear that what if I invest a couple of grand, pay for this guy, pay for this girl to go on training, and then they go somebody else, somewhere else. And I was like, well, that's risk. 
in business and they, they just didn't understand and i just said business is risk well, well 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 the biggest risk is that you don't train them and they do stay with you yeah 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 and i, I just like look have basic things so it, so in our contract for example we have a pay down term so i i'm happy you know we, we don't have an official cap because nobody has asked for something crazy um yeah if somebody went actually look there's a mastermind that's 100 grand that i want to go on it's like you're a you're an assistant or you're, you're doing admin or stuff like that, probably not going to do it. But nobody's taking the piss yet, but we, we just got a basic, basic two year pay down in that if you leave within the first year, you owe 100% of that. If you leave in the second year, you get oh, 50% and then after that it's done. But you know, this is a continuous investment in yourself, a continuous investment in your team. And I've, I've gone through, you know, a lot the, the lessons that I've learned is pay a bit more for the right people. Um, and and actually realizing that the cost difference isn't that that big. So, um, you know, a, a, a recent hire that I've got, um, I don't want to name names because I feel bad. It's like, so, so they're 26,000, right? And there was somebody else that was, I really liked them, but they were 22,000, but the gap, in knowledge, the gap in experience was huge. So it's an extra four thousand pounds that is like spread over, and it's kind of like actually, you, if you can afford the best people to get eighteen players, it will pay you back dividends. Because what people don't realise as you expand the team, most likely you'll need office space eventually. Not everyone does, but probably you've got the cost of the seat. The cost of the desk, and I don't literally mean paying for a seat, paying for a desk, but the rent, the rates, the bills that you're paying on that, the extra hundred quid every night you're going out uh, with the, all of those things that really mount up. And actually, you can pay 25, 30 grand for somebody that you could pay 18, 19, 20 grand for somebody, but they're it's almost like having two or three people in their place and people don't invest like that. Well, it is. when you look at it in terms of actual ROI, I think you'll find that the, the numbers the numbers work on an even more exaggerated level as well. Because I mean, I've, I've had this time and time again, you know, myself where, for example, I might, I might be hiring for a role, you know, the roles are relevant, but let's say I'm looking at someone who's 50 grand and then somebody else, somebody else comes along, or somebody else who's recommended to me, who may be substantially more. Let's let's say eighty grand. Um, and yeah, and, and on the face of it, you know, your immediate reaction is, well, look, I mean, th th those two figures are just far too out out of kilter. You know, okay, I mean, you know we're talking twenty four, twenty six, but you know, to, the difference between fifty grand and eighty grand is astronomical. However, <laughs> I guess my <laughs> the way I always look at it is, well, look, if that person really is. Th that much better then then they're gonna they're gonna provide an ROI of mu of multiple lots of 30 grand and the risk of hiring them actually isn't you know isn't 30 grand because the reality is you know with most people you know you can interview and interview and interview and you never really know until the day they start but within you know I I used to say within the first week or two weeks of someone working for you you know you know exactly what they're going to be like I honestly think you, within the first hour or two of them working for you now, you know if there's going to be a change in in interview personality to real life personality, or, or if they're going to have bullshitted their way through an interview uh, and the, and the, and they can you know talk the talk but not walk the walk, you know it on their first day in the office. So the reality is, if this you know extremely more expensive hire is going to not work out, they're going to not work out in the first month or two or three, let's say. And so, you, so you're not talking thirty grand; you're talking two and a half grand a month times one or two or three months. So you know, you, 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 so that's your, that's your level of that's your level of risk. But then again, the reality is, you know, when you talk about salespeople. <laughs> And and you say, well, if I hire this guy, and you know he, he's on a you know he's on a hundred grand basic, and you know I'm I'm going to have to get rid of him. He's going to cost me you know tens and tens and tens of thousands. And look, th there may be extreme circumstances where someone delivers nothing, but you know it, I think you, you've got a very unfortunate you know freak situation where someone actually del you know de really delivers nothing. So I think you know so by the time you you actually take that you know that 30, 40, 50 grand wage differential, fractionalize it across two or three months, and then knock off 
what they actually have contributed anyway. Uh, you know, yes, yes, there's still financial risk there, but that's you know, but that, that's that's business. Um, and uh, you know, taking it back to back to where you were, you know, you just really cannot overpay to have to have the right people. And that, you know, what what one of one of, uh, one of the staff in a business I'm involved with at the moment is uh, is 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 looking looking to recruit an admin related position. So we go, I guess we're kind of going from one end, you know, one end of the spectrum to the other here. And this was a role that you know that uh, she wanted to hire someone at uh, you know pay them eighteen or nineteen grand, and I and I, I said to, almost flippantly pay them twenty pay twenty five pay twenty six. And she's like yeah but you know, but we don't need to. And my view is that even if you know you, you're just getting someone to make the you know, to to make the coffee and do the photocopying and you know, do, do a bit of admin around the office, the caliber the difference in caliber of person you know you, you'd get from, you'd get from eighteen to twenty five or you know, or, or from from you know from minimum wage to minimum wage plus a pound or two an hour is just astronomical and you know and, and the the positive the positive impact that this person will bring on your business compared to the negative impact that this person will on the you know, will bring because you're spending all your time teaching them how to do something you know re re reminding them <laughs> reminding them where the right filing cabinets are you know you you just you just cannot you, know, you just can't overpay for you cannot overpay for the right people yeah it's a very very good point I, I, I you picked on I picked up on something that you said uh, just a second ago when you were, when you were talking about it and it was all about like office space and how with everything that's gone on in the world right now, how everything's kind of like changing. So I've always wanted like laptop type life, right? We're in a flipping insane place right now with this scenery and stuff. And we were just working this morning, weren't we? Just out here on the desk and being able to do that. And I've got a team. I don't have an office. I've got a team of four now who are operating within the Instagram marketing stuff. And to be fair, I, I kind of come at it from as long as I get their work done, and they are delivering and hitting targets, hitting quotas that we put in place to measure. I'm quite happy, I don't really mind where they are because I want them to be able to kind of experience the same lifestyle that we have, earn good money whilst doing it and have fun at the same time. And I've kind of embraced that and all. Uh, but obviously I've been in your offices and again, you, you've still got that office culture, but with the way that Corona's gone, the pandemic's gone, what's your, what's your, what's your kind of take on it? Will you always have an office or would you scale yeah. it back? How would yeah. you work it? No, no doubt in my head at all. Um, that's not what it has taught me is that people can do bouts of staying home, but there's there's so many more benefits um, to it. So there's the control aspect where you can see, smell, touch, not your staff, <laughs> but you can, you can see, you can, it is that accountability. And when people, it's kind of like virtual assistants. So we've got virtual assistants over in the Philippines um, and we don't screen check like at all, like a few times a year, but we always let them know, are you okay downloading this on your computer? What it means is at any point we can be watching your screen. Do you feel comfortable with that? And just because they know that, it's like this mentality uh, type thing. But what I did notice is a few things during lockdown is people had the initial getting used to being at home, then their productivity went up and it was, it was never on par with being in the office. It's is probably at 80, 90%, which was fine going through that period. But there's a few different things I noticed. First of all, towards the end, it started going like that. And I was like, right, it's time to get, uh, get people in. So will I be flexible about it? Sure. You know, you know what you've earned working from home for a week or something like that. But there's the distractions, you, you know, like the fact you could pop into the <laughs> fridge and the big one, sorry, the, the really big one, again, like we keep seem, seem to go back to it, the mental health people started ringing me and sort of going, I just need a chat. And it wasn't talking about their role. It was just having a chat about what they're going through. And, you know, we, we as humans are not made to be alone. Um, yes, it's incredible what we've got right now being out here. And I love the idea of maybe saying to staff one day, you know what, I'm going to go work from a villa for a month. Who wants to come out and work for a month? Uh, with me out there, you know, bring your laptops. And, and some will be able to do that, some won't. Tumbleweed. No one wants to go with you. Yeah, <laughs> apart from Alex, you, know, you are coming with me. But, but there's, there's a lot of benefits and there's, there's, there's a lot. It doesn't have to be like a cubicle, right, get on there like that. But people see other people putting in the extra hours. People see, you, you know, it's not like, well, you've been in my office. It doesn't get to five and people are like, right, I'm walking out the door. It, it's, it's really good. And also, I'm a big believer that like it, you almost step into something. So like when you step into the office, 
it's money mode. You're, you're making money. It's, it's all about that. It's really hard to work from at full capacity. It's too easy to, like I noticed my early morning, well, not that early, like we're talking 8 a.m. sales calls. Uh, w w one particular guy started turning up rougher and rougher and I I'm convinced that he was still in his pajamas. You know, I'm convinced that he was just sort of like, all right, guys, let's smash it and then straight into bed. I mean, it's interesting what you say because I would, I'd agree with elements of it, but then I also think that, that what we've just discussed then really highlights how getting the right staff is is is, is absolutely crucial um and and i guess you know that is fundamental to probably everything everything we'll talk about today and every other aspect of the business because you know you talk about how productivity dipped you know dramatically or fell off a cliff and then kind of built its way up to 80 90 percent which but but i think if you've got the right if you've got the right staff uh, then, then the productivity of them, whether they're in the off, well, whether they're in the office or at home, I was going to say shouldn't differ, but really, it should actually they should be more productive at home. I mean, I I know during lockdown, I was a lot, I was a lot more productive uh, because I was doing you know I was doing a lot more hours, uh, you know, because you know I didn't have travel time, I didn't have distractions. You know, I've, I've been I've been it's funny, you know, you, you talk about distractions of like like going to the fridge or or your your wife asking you to yeah you know, to, to a change the tumble dryer or whatever it may be. I mean, I find the distractions. The oh, I mean, empty the tumble dryer. <laughs> I still haven't learned how to do my washing. Um, but, you know, in, in all seriousness, if I go and sit at, sit at my desk in the office, you know, people come up to me all day. Uh, you know, d uh, d distracting me. You know, n needing me for something, and I and I never get long bouts of time to get through the things I want to do. So you know, I guess in a pre-COVID world, uh, you know, I I would I would do a lot of my work either late at night or early in the morning before I've come into the work because I I could not go into the office and sit and you know create a document or 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 you know or, or get get through two or three hours of consistent you know un uninterrupted time. So you know, I was much, much more productive at home, and I, and I know you know certain other, you know, certain other members of my staff were more productive at home. But then, in the same token, other ones weren't because you know it's an excuse to play with the kids, you know, or it's an excuse to sit in your pajamas or or, or, or to do whatever. Um, and I, and again, for me, it's not you know a representation so much of is it best to have an office or to not have an office, or you know does home working work? You know, it just it really takes you back to the fact of you know. Know, how how do you hire the right people? You know, you know what 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 are the right people? And how do you keep those right people motivated? Because you know, I mean, you know, again, we're not naming names, but you know, I I know that uh, I can think of five members of staff right now who I could not check in on for the next you know for, for the next three months, and I know that they'd be working seven days a week, yeah. you know, 10, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. I mean, I've, I've got you know, m multiple members of staff where you know they'll they'll let's say can I ask me can I have this hot time for holiday or do you mind do you mind if I you know take something off at like ridiculously short notice or whatever and never ever I always get to the fact of saying to them, why are you even asking me you know you, you know the answer is always going to be yes then I've got probably ten times as many of that members of staff where when they ask if they can have some time off even though they're entitled to holiday I fucking resent it because I think you fucking lazy prick you know um, you, you, you don't do anything in the you don't do anything in the office ne ne never mind when you're at home. Um, so I guess you know, yeah, for, for me, it just all keeps keeps coming back to that. Um, that how, how do you hire the right people? Yeah, it's, it, it is that attitude versus aptitude, isn't it? Where'd you go? And and for me, um, people always go, you know, is it personality or how good? It's just like, well, surely they have to have a minimum criteria to their aptitude levels. But attitude for me is everything. So like, I, I think I'm really fortunate um, in that aspect. I think virtual and together there's about 18 19 um staff that i've got and every single one of them i trust implicit i mean i've got some new guys that we'll we'll see right but trust implicitly um to do it but i do think there's personality differences i, I know there were some people that were like i get um uh, my pa kd she was like i get loads more done at home um, and it was like, right, amazing. Whereas there were other people that were like, look, Jamie, do you mind if I come in the office and just work from the office in the corner and stuff like that? Um, and, it's, and, it, and it's down to what we can do. So for me, I like mixing it up where 
Um, so so I'm, I'm the complete opposite. You're saying your productivity. Um, I get what you mean with people coming up to you in the office. Every It feels like it's every five minutes. And as your team grows, that, that holiday thing, somebody said to me a few years, you know, it will get to a point where your team's so big that it feels like, there's never a hundred percent of people there because everyone's always taking holiday and it obviously rotates or there's every day somebody's bloody ill and it's just like, what the hell is happening here? But for me, um, I have to go somewhere to work. So even if it's going to the local Costa and putting my headphones on because I, I step out of home life. And then when I go back, I'm still working, you know, in the evening and, and stuff like that. Like you've been over when, when we're working, but we'll put suits on in the background and it's not working. We probably it's a like, romantic evening. Yeah, yeah romantic course. evening. Yeah. We're curled up on the sofa together, you know, and I'm going to stop that there. Yeah, please, please stop. Please. Before I go down that route. <laughs> no, but, but, but it is down to personalities and there, there's a lot of different factors. I personally don't think I will get rid of it. Um, I think it's, for some people, it's, it's that place where they can go to to get away from home life and, and get their head down. I think the thing, whether it's an office or not, I will 100% always have a hub where people can come together. Um, whether that is in its current remit as a fixed office, I don't know, um, or something like this, which is a bit of an upgrade, pretty cool. <laughs> um, then I'll do that as well. But yeah, I do. I do think it's important for for what I've got going on. Going back to your pay, your pay situation, because there's just something lingering in my head. I think you're absolutely right. And there's there's a guy in America, massive marketer called Ryan Dice. Um, he's one one of the biggest in the world. And I was chatting to one of his higher ups and i mean salaries in america are crazy um but they were saying that their hiring practices if the if you're in the first five years of being a marketer it was like you're just going to get your bog standard money they'll never they'll never pay extra you've got to prove yourself but then once you get to a higher executive level they'll pay usually 30 percent above what you'd get anywhere else and i was just like that's a fair wedge and it's like yeah but it's negligible you know, so they gave the example of $100,000. And I was like, that's, that's some big bloody money. It was like, yeah, but it's standard out here. $100,000, we'll pay them 130. And I'm just like, okay. And it's like, yeah, but that extra 30 grand, make sure that they, if there's a project that needs to get done, they get it done. You are attracting the best in the industry because everywhere else, they're negotiating between 95 and 105. And you just come in and go, I'll offer you 130. It blows them out of the water. And you know... You know, it's not that money is the sole motivator for people. That's like numbers. I think it's number seven on most people's list. But it's just like, you know, it's it kind of takes something away, doesn't it? It takes away the risk of somebody coming in and taking them because of the money. Um, and it, it's a big thing of price is what you pay, value is what you get. Yeah. And I know we're not specifically talking about today, but, you know, so, so, something I'm always a, a big advocate for is, uh, you know, is understanding margins and finding business models that have fat margins or, or finding ways to add value to your business to be able to, to, be, to, be able to increase your margins, increase your gross, gross profit. And, you know, we always talk about the fact that, you know, without margin, you know, you can't invest in your business, you can't invest in your staff, you can't invest in capital equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I guess, you know, when we use words like negligible here, uh, you know, this is, this is you know, the, the case in point that, you know, on the face of it, you know, paying that extra 30 grand a year sound, sounds very expensive and it is going to seriously, seriously cut into your margin. But if you, if you can find a, a business model or find a way to make your business model have 10, 15, 20, 30, 40% higher margins than your competition, then you can very easily pay these increases of salary, uh, and, you know, and and all of a sudden, you know, your, your life is so much easier uh, because you know when when you've got staff that aren't causing you problems and you've got fat margins and cash in the bank, all of a sudden, you know, the the, the, the business horizon looks very very different. Yeah, and it's at that level as well. It's there's so much more to it. You know, if, if you're hiring somebody in the first five years of their uh, employee life, if you like, or their working life, say five, first five, ten years, you're going on attitude and aptitude. But when you're hiring at the executive level, and I, I've always thought business, you want to get your core strong team and understand that at the lower levels there will be higher turnover either because they're coming to you for a couple of years and then wanting to go elsewhere, or you're getting promoted, or you've hired, you know, you're firing whatever you're doing. But actually, at that executive level, let's say an operations director, um, you're going to bring somebody in at, let's say the average is 60, you put them in at 80, like you were saying, and 
they're bringing the great attitude. Um, you bring in all of those years of experience. And I don't just mean for them, but the cultures that they've been in. And, and the big one for me is the contacts that they've picked up. So some really high level people, they'll be able to tell you, you want to you wanna have this person in your team. And I've known them for 25 years on the golf course. You know, I'm going to go have a chat with them, schmooze them a bit and bring them over. Um, it's the access to finance that they've got because, well, obviously you're in the game a little bit with, well, in heavy weight, not a little bit. Um, and I'm a big believer it's, it's, it's all about relationships in that, you know, is can you know, like and trust them? And if you've got somebody that's working for you that's got a 25 year relationship with all of the bank managers and stuff like that, that's going to bring a huge amount. Even, and actually, I'd almost go because, because you know it's the it's not what you know it's who you know i think that's out of bullshit but i think who you know adds an incredible amount of value um on top and for me if there was somebody that i was like oh, i'm deciding between these two people that one's got a little bit less experience but man that guy's black book i take them i take them all day 100%. i think that's like one of the things i think it's worth talking about actually because i think we're all very very good at it in our own different way but i think it's probably one of the most underestimated skills in terms of relationship building as a as a business owner i think it's the one thing like being able to like you know, looking at this like the opportunity that's come just from this trip like just from being able to connect with someone just over like a three to four hour period sensibly and i just think um what, what are your thoughts on it like i personally believe it's like one of the most underestimated it's very very difficult to teach however if there was some way of being able to teach it's like basic communication skills teach what relationship just relationship building right i think it's the thing that's definitely the reason why i've been able to scale so quickly i would never been able to do it if i didn't have the, the support the friends uh, the mentors the guidance around and yeah you've got to pay for mentors and all that sort of thing and you almost got to make a name for yourself somehow but it's 100 percent the thing that i don't hear many people talk about I mean, I mean i always find it quite a hard thing to let's say to put my finger on and explain in terms of how to do it or how to do it better i mean i mean 100 you know i'll always say that all of my successes or, or certainly the vast majority of them in business uh, you know, come come from relationships. You know, whether that's uh, you know get, getting an investor because of a relationship, or being introduced to a borrower because of a relationship, or, or being being able to you know meet the right members of staff, or even even in, into your personal life of of having great relationships. You know, with with, with the right friend, or, or or with your girlfriend, or your wife, or your kid, or you know, or, or or whatever that may be. Um, and you know. I, but then I also find it hard to say. Well, how do you how do you build those relationships? And I guess well, ev everyone has to know in themselves. Uh, you know, what, I guess you know what you like, who you get on with. You know, and how how do you build that rapport and how do you build that connection? I mean. I actually was having this conversation the other day with someone a uh, bit before you guys got out here, and he was saying, "Well, you know, how do you build a relationship with a dick? You know, how 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 do you uh, you know." get on with someone that you don't get on with and uh, and my only answer to him really was you know you you can't win everyone i mean like, if, if, if someone is a dick then the chances are i'm not going to want to build a relationship with them now no, like you know i may be in a a, a a more fortunate position now because you know I, let's say I've, I've got x amount of scale and you know x amount of money so that i don't need to deal with the people that i don't want to deal with but you know, even so i guess you know we, we all we all still have our price you know if 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 there was someone who was a total dick but you know i was had the opportunity to you know, do a very very substantial multi-million pound deal with them then obviously i'm gonna i'm gonna put my preferences to one side and uh, and and, tr and try and try and get on with them uh but you know I, I think for me it's it's finding people who um who you want to do business with or you want to build a relationship with because you think that you know, you'll be able to benefit each other then assessing whether or not you know you do genuinely like each other and and, and, and can and can build a relationship uh, and then and ju and then just be normal now i guess you know we're talking about this you know this here in ibiza and i, I think that ultimately you have to, you know, you have to invest in relationship building. Now, whether that's an investment in time or an investment in money, uh, you know, it's it's impossible to build the great relationships, you know, without that investment. Um, and um, I guess, you know, to, to, to a degree as well, you know, it, it almost depends. Uh, the more you're willing to invest, maybe the deeper and the quicker, the quicker the, rela the relationships can be. Um, but I think if you're building the relationships with the right people um, and you've targeted those people properly in the first place, then the ROI 
on any investment you make sh you know sh should make it an investment as, as as opposed to being a cost you know i mean you know, c c coming coming here for a couple of weeks um you know and, and ha having people here and, you know, and doing the things we do you know you could look at it and say well that's that's a phenomenal cost you know now wh whether that's a, you know and we can contextualize this to anything whether you're spending 10 grand 20 30 40 50 100 grand you could look at it as 100 grand cost but the way i'd look at it is saying well look if i've put the right people in that situation situation uh, you know the the relationships that i'm going to have built by the end of that two weeks uh the, the 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 business that i'm either going to have done or have the ability to do should be well 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 in excess of the cost of actually putting it on in the first place and and if it isn't then that's really my fault and my failure yeah you, you just got to want to do it i think that's the biggest thing like if anyone like starting out is the thing that i really knew very very quickly that networking was going to be the thing that got me to where I wanted to be very, very quickly. I did it from a social media point of view, was that the more I was visible, the more I became known, the more people wanted to be around me and then get to know me. And then that led to business opportunities. Right, We met at a networking event, didn't we? So did we. We all met at different networking events. And because we're putting ourselves in positions to actually communicate with people, say hello, introduce yourself, grab a beer, take someone out for some food. Um, it's, it's, it's not difficult to do, but I think people just take it for granted and don't spend the time doing it because they get trapped in, I've just got to sell, I've got to market, I've got to be in my operations, I've got to train people. But actually, the number one thing that enables you to scale at speed is just building relationships with people, taking the time to go to events, taking the time to go out for a meal. I mean, we all went for a meal before we went away, like the business that's done on that sort of table for three hours. I mean, it's hard to call that work, but ultimately it is. It's like how we spend our time. So powerful. Well, uh, I had uh, you know had a conversation with a, with a, a sales guy who works for me. You know, uh, I remember this a few months ago. You know, uh, the guy the guy worked for us for a few years. He had no relationships. He he wasn't he wasn't selling well at all. He wasn't selling well because he didn't have any relationships. Uh, and he was saying to me that you know he, he didn't know how to build them, didn't didn't have time to build them. You know, didn't know where to go, what to do. And even at its most basic level, I'm saying to him, right, every single day you come to work, so five days a week for you know for whatever, 48, 48 weeks of the year, you go for lunch every day with the same people from with the same people from from the same office, you know that that what that one hour a day, you know what why are you not going for lunch with five different people every single day, you know whether that's prospects for this for the business you're working in for me or whether that's just people that might further your life as well because again you know people miss the fact that every relationship you make these are actually your relationships you know yes while you're working for me i'll benefit from the fact that you've got more relationships but when you choose to leave me to you know to take a different role or to set up a business in yourself whatever you know these relationships are, are, are yours you know i i i don't have them um and 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 you you know you you're really letting yourself down by not taking every single opportunity possible to build them. But uh, you know, and again, you know, pe people may listen to this or watch this or 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 you know, talk to me sometimes about let's say some of the relationships I've built in some of the situations I've built them in. So well, I, you know, I, I don't have those budgets or I don't have that time. But you can very sim you can be doing it very simply by going to Costco. It's Costco, Costa, or Starbucks, or you do Costco. They do some great takeaways. They do a little bit of Costco. They do a lovely pizza, don't they? Um, but you know, going going anywhere. Uh, you know, on on any budget, um, but you know, pe people just don't don't make the first call, don't make the first step. Yeah, yeah it's you know a, a bit a big one that I really love is your network is your net worth, and you know I, I think there are some key strategies to it. So first of all, I'm a big believer with uh, relationships being sort of like an inch wide, mile deep, and you know having deep, purposeful relationships. But how do you get deep, purposeful relationships? Well, first of all, you need to put yourself out there. You you know if if you're going from that social media point of view, outreach. How many people are you reaching out to a day? You know, you'll get some people going, mate, fuck off, I'll get 10 of you reach. It's just like, okay, we'll find a unique way. Don't just copy and paste it across. If you can reach, I'd rather reach out to 20 people a day. You can spend an hour a day, five minutes on each person, quickly looking through, saying, hey, saw your social media post that you posted two weeks ago about this, found it really interesting. Out of interest, what's your view on that? You know, a, an opener, um, kind of like that. And, um, and if you put yourself out there and you talk to 
go to lunch with somebody different and, you know, net your time a little bit. Do it with four or five people. Have Even if it is just a quick half an hour lunch, you can quickly assess them and who you think will, you'll benefit from it. And then you develop deeper and deeper and deeper relationships over time. I do think relationships is selling. Um, it's a form of sales. But people get selling so wrong and we speak about it a lot like um you know you've got two ears one mouth you use it in that ratio you'll be a much better salesperson but people think of selling as a forcing something you know second uh, second hand car dealership like buy my stuff and actually selling is about listening i'm a big believer and and if you can build a relationship with somebody from a point of view of how can i add value to this person and you take the time to listen to them, what do they do, contextualize where they want to go in, like kind of what you're saying about the staff, you know, where do you want them to be in 18 months? But just as important or more important is where do they want to be? What excites them? What motivates them? What what problems are you going through in business that I, if I put some thought into, I could probably help? And I think if you go out and do that and you have that value add mentality, it, you're, you're going you're gonna to make amazing amounts of money and more important and it's that roi it's 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 ridiculous i don't think it can be fully measured this does the financial roi but happiness doing what you're doing you know it was wasn't monday it's two two mondays ago um i was absolutely shattered i've been doing a push for a launch for the last hundred days really and you were like look let's go out for dinner tonight and I was it was like the day before and I was like mate I've got this line I've got this I've got this I've got this I'd just done two hours on a set online seminar he's like come on mate let's go for dinner and I was just not feeling it at all and it was just like well come on come out for dinner you go no choice. I dragged yeah <laughs> dra dragged me along and you know obviously you were terrible company um <laughs> but I very much enjoy my own and the food was good <laughs> no no but you know we we end up going out for a good what two, three hours having a chat, we ended up getting kicked out because we were, we were there so late. And it's just actually just enjoying the conversation, just having a chat, no sort of motive. Fast forward, that's why we're here now having this chat and we'll see what comes from that. But, you, you know, the, if you look at who you surround yourself with in life, you can pretty much measure somebody. You know, if you want to know somebody's bank, and I don't just mean how much money's in there, but overall bank as a person, look at who they're spending time with. And it was... um. What was it? it wasn't Napoleon Hill, but it was in how, uh, Think and Grow Rich, that you are the average of the five people you spend most time with. And I don't know if it's five. Uh, I don't know if it's 10. I don't know if it's 100. I'm, I'm sure it's not a fixed number, but it makes sense if you're going to spend all your time with knock-off Nigel down the pub that knows everything about nothing, that talks shit about everyone, you're going to become that person. Whereas actually, if you spend and invest your time with people that are talking business, marketing, scaling, networking, you're probably going to uh, progress to that as well. So yeah, massive, massive fan of networking and building relationships.